back, <laughs> and so are we. Hi, uh, hey guys. This is uh, welcome. <laughs> welcome to West Coast Weekly. Uh, this is a show that answers your biggest questions about every single episode of Game of Thrones. I'm Philip Molina, and I'm Eric Voss, and. Episode two actually had no deaths, yeah. which is shocking. There was also no dragons, what? I think maybe because we had a dire wolf. Yeah. Uh, and we're not allowed to have both of those in one yeah, episode. They're the same person. <laughs> uh, and we had a few seconds of White Walkers, yeah. specifically White Walkers, the most White Walkers we've ever seen in one place. Yeah. Uh, and not whites, which I do have a theory about that we can get into mm-hmm. later. Uh, in general, though, I thought it was a really nice, touching, like great hour of television. Yeah, it was just kind of beautiful. A lot of like uh, emotional moments. I feel kind of drained. You know, I could use a horn of that giant's milk that Tormund was going way into you know i think it's a little too late for you uh but uh osteoporosis <laughs> is uh irreversible <laughs> yeah you got those bird bones now uh we guys uh, we want to remind you guys that all of our game of thrones coverage is available on this westeros weekly podcast feed uh we're still going to do our great episode breakdowns I, again that's a reminder to all of you that scream at us every time yeah. these better not be replacing the breakdowns yeah they're they coming. don't we we're, everything's additive uh if you see that in the comments let them know hey no they're still doing the breakdowns yes. and those actually come out later in the week but you get all of our season 8 content in audio form earlier in the week earlier than video versions just uh, get that on the West Coast Weekly podcast either on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast also just real quick we started a new podcast yeah. feed for our MCU content. So if you're a fan of all our Marvel stuff, it's called Inside Marvel. Uh, and it's covering right now, obviously, a little movie called Avengers Endgame. Oh, yeah, that whole uh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, let's get into your guys' great questions that you have. We're going to answer them. We're also going to hit up our weekly power rankings uh, that you guys vote on uh, every week. But let's just start with maybe the big question. Yeah, let's do it. What oh, the? <laughs> Whoa! What is this? I'm, you caught it. Okay, yeah. For podcast. It's Hot a and wet. giant wet hot <laughs> green egg just <laughs> landed on us. Uh, all right, let's see what's inside. All right. Whoa! Okay. <laughs> a little message is in it. Uh, okay, here we go. At DKN seventy one five hundred asks: Is hiding in a crypt a good idea when fighting someone who reanimates the dead? Okay, so this person's excellent on, question. On, on to where what we're thinking here. Um, a lot of people actually are bringing this up. Uh, I <laughs> destroyed that egg. Yeah. Uh, uh, so this place is where there are hundreds of years worth of dead people uh, to hang out when the army of dead comes into town. Uh, and, you know, so the dead isn't just going to be coming from outside the gates. It literally could be coming from inside the castle. Ooh. Uh, uh, <laughs> the calls coming from, from uh, a phone that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, I've heard that uh, uh, urban legend. Yeah. So, so here's the issue. I think that this is actually by design. I don't think oh, they're yeah. they're like slipping up like wait, let's put the characters in there. I think that we're seeing some machinations at work of setting up something much greater than than we've anticipated. Uh over and over again in the episode characters keep saying the safest place is oh, going yeah. to be in the crypts. That sounds way too good. Yeah, to be it's true. like Chekhov's crypt, right? Like yeah. you can't keep setting up this crypt and then not deliver some kind of horrible thing to happen down there. Yeah, I mean yeah. To be clear, Chekhov's crypt is an actual place where the man yeah. is buried. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's not a horrible place. I always place. thought he was cremated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so the crypts are, as, as we understand it, if we follow what's been said this episode, they are going to be filled with the women and the children. Mm-hmm. But also, I remember as Ned Umber just kind of creepily reminded us last week, uh, the Night King in the show is not afraid to kill a kid or a bunch of kids uh, and turn them all into screeching whites. Yeah. Um, also, Gilly tells that, that little girl with the scar on her face that they're going to need protectors down there, mm. um, which could be something they need to pay off, right? That could be some foreshadowing. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up that little girl because a lot of people are saying that uh, there's scars on her faces. Uh, Sir Davos gave her a peculiar look. Obviously, she's reminding him of Shireen Baratheon, mm-hmm. whom he had that strong friendship with. She taught mm-hmm. him how to read, how to put letters together to form words, and why it's weird that there's a G in the word knight. Uh, but it's it's uh, this emotional moment. He knows that she was burned alive, and that's that was a powerful thing that divided him and Lady Melisandre. So if these kids do get turned into whites down the crypts are we gonna see like a moment where he oh, has to repeat history and burn this sweet little badass oh my god well in that the face she's making in the graphic we chose she's she doesn't look so sweet but, yeah oh, no, no. yeah uh but uh that is crazy uh, uh one of our stardust uh question askers and we'll get to those uh later pointed out that in this moment you can kind of hear a shireen song oh yeah the, the music yeah, yeah yeah uh thanks for that observation but okay so here, even though we're all on the same page,
page. Now, like, yeah, maybe it's not going to go so well. I think that this is setting up for something even bigger than just, oh, maybe the dead get reanimated in there and mm-hmm. they, they slaughter these people. So I think some of the most interesting and important action of the next episode actually will take place in the crypts rather than in the battlefields. Mm. We do have that moment that we saw uh, in the initial trailer of Arya running in the castle, seeming like, you know, I know you theorized about what she could be running from, right. but it's important to recognize that's happening inside the castle. There was also in next week's preview, and we'll look at it again at the end of the episode, mm-hmm. there's characters that are very scared inside of the castle. So I think if we kind of look at what happened here, we put a lot of very important characters in the crypts, right? We have uh, Tyrion is is going to be there. They made a big point of that. Sam is going to be in there. We know from the clips Varys is going to be in there. Also, Sansa is going to be in there. These are two important of characters to uh, put down there and then not be relevant to what's going to happen in next week's episode. Also, I'm going to throw in there real quick. Obviously, there's a lot of dead Starks in there. We said that a second ago. Specifically, though, one if, if I have to throw out one, we don't know so much about Ned's headless body if, it, if it's there. Oh, right. But we know that Rickon is down there. They made a point of telling us he's down there. They also made a point of that that body has not been burned. Right. Uh, so we could have Ghost Rick on. Come yeah. In. And we know Ned Stark's bones are down there. Littlefinger told Rob, uh, told John this back last season. I personally saw that right. you're, uh, but his body is like a skeleton at this point. We don't know how much uh, tissue has to be yeah. there for it to if be If it's kind of like what's happen- happened in the Children of the Forest, you, you know, with the former kings, there could be skeletons. Yeah. Could, skeletons could come, could come alive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't think we could recognize Ned Stark's skeleton right, without yeah. a head. Uh, yeah. But Or maybe we can. The acting is that good. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so here's my point. All of these characters down there, and then Tyrion is down there. We had a big conversation between uh, Tyrion and Bran that we did not see what happened, right. what came yeah, of it. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Tyrion now knows information, and they make a point about how he has the best mind in Westeros. He's the ultimate strategist, right? So if he's in there, he has this extra information and all the characters seem to be like getting pushed back in there. I feel like this is going to play out like the Battle of Helm's Deep in oh, yeah. Lord of the Rings. Uh, you you and I were talking about the the directing of the episode. It, it implies that it definitely is going to do that. Yeah, right? Miguel Sapochnik, who directed uh, Hard Home and the Battle, Battle of the Bastards, Bastards right? uh, he had the whole crew and they closely studied the Battle of Helm's Deep and the Two Towers to figure out how they could uh, conceive and direct the different movements to tell different types of stories and different areas of focus throughout a big sprawling battle in order to humanize it from different points of view. And specifically, we were talking about how that battle includes many of the people of Rohan in the crypts or in the in the caverns and the tunnels mm-hmm. deep in the walls of the of the castle and how that battle, the orcs keep pushing in further and further right. past the battlements into different layers of the castle. It, it's kind of these, uh, these moments that happen in the best drama and the, it's, ironically the one that's coming to mind in this moment is actually uh, Toy Story 3 where they're <laughs> headed toward toward the flames, right? Uh, oh, they're yeah, all yeah. going to get melted. Uh, <laughs> but my, my point is more these things where that's really where things become so dire that yes. you really feel like, I guess they're all going to die then. Uh, and we've seen Miguel Sapochnik show us that in a couple of different ways, right? With with Hard Home, but also with Battle of the Bastards, specifically the way that that it was the pinch maneuver ba- basically that was being mm-hmm. used, uh, and also it was referencing Ron uh, and, a, and a bunch of other great war yeah, films. The Kurosawa yeah, Kurosawa stuff, yeah. Uh, he's showed so many different ways to make it feel like there's no way out of this battle. Mm-hmm. And of course, na- last time was the Knights of the Vale, uh, last minute. I think that this is just one more way to show us this is this is absolutely going to go as bad as it can. Yes. They're going to lose on every front. It's going to get all the way pushed down into these crypts. And the last surviving characters might be literally just the people in, who made it to the crypts. And then maybe mm. there's some sort of special way out. Maybe it's very reminiscent of actually the Children of the Forest scene too, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and the hold the door moment, right? It was just, oh, right, just yeah. like getting pushed back further and further. I think that's what's going to happen next week, but we're going to find out so soon if I'm completely wrong. Yeah, it's <laughs> it seems like the idea. I mean, uh, Bran told Jamie earlier that who knows if there's an afterwards, and it's suggesting this idea. There's at least this possibility that this could end in full defeat, despite how confident these characters are that there's a way out. This could end in disaster for them in retreat of survival falling back to some other location for a more intimate battle happening mm-hmm. later in these final four episodes. Uh, and we saw that teaser, that aftermath teaser uh, that, you know, I, I, rem- I would go more into this in the breakdown that I'm working on of like the kind of imagery. Is this something that is predicting something we might actually see or something that Bran has already uh, saw and maybe clued Tyrion in on? And that's what the conversation was that we didn't see. Right. So 
I, I'm just predicting one. It's going to be with this episode where you're you you realize you haven't taken a, a breath in like a, sure, a minute yeah. or something, right? Like we're going to be holding our breath a lot. Uh, two, this one's a, a swing bec- uh, that could be a miss because Sapochnik doesn't do this normally, but I think it could be directed more like a horror movie too. Yeah, it's a combination of Helm's Deep, but also there's you know something in the dark and, and there's a, a kind of like a, a zombie in the yeah, house. Yeah, Night movie. of the Living Dead. The original kind of Night thing. of the Living yeah. Dead, right? Exactly. Yeah, for sure. Ooh, I'm so excited, man. Yes, I'm very very excited. Ooh. Oh, we have another! Whoa, our Gosh. Raven's back. A uh, Raven puppet. Did you <laughs> squeeze out that egg, Raven? <laughs> okay. It, well, why was it a green dragon egg that yeah. the Raven brought in? Oh earlier? boy. Uh, okay. Well, at Daniel J. Santos asks us, "What's the significance of the song that Podrick sang in this episode?" That's an interesting question. Very interesting moment that had a lot of like backstory and connection yeah, to the books. Yeah, the the uh, the iPod is blasting uh, <laughs> a gorgeous song, uh, uh, Jenny's song, right? Uh, or uh, Jenny of Old Stones. Mm-hmm, also, mm-hmm. that's actually uh, there, we hear the version of the song at the end, which by Florence the Machine, which also would have been amazing if oh, they're she like, covered it for the credits yeah. version. Yeah, I, I kind of had a moment where they were like, "Is anyone here a singer?" And then just Ed Sheeran just walks back <laughs> yeah. in, like, "Actually, I survived." And I never blink anymore. My eyelids were. <laughs> yeah. bl- uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it is from the books though, partially, right? Right. Yeah. This it's from the books. Uh, the character of Jenny of Old Stones is uh, is alluded to and introduced. We hear this song while we look at a lot of our favorite characters in a montage, foreshadowing that some of them will probably die and some of them will be left behind to remember those that have died. And uh, this episode, Sam told us that uh, remembering the memory of humanity, the history of humanity, is what makes us human. That is our existence. But uh, talking about in the books, uh, Jenny's song in the books, it's about Jenny of Old Stones, who had a love affair with Prince Duncan Targaryen from the Duncan Egg series, uh, and he abdicated the throne in order to marry her. So Duncan died at the tragedy of Summerhall as a big explosion uh, that was a result of his father, King Aegon V, trying to bring dragons back to Westeros. Uh, and Jenny brought a woods witch to court with her, and the witch predicted that the prince uh, that the prince that was promised, or Azor Ahai, those uh, prophecies are now one and the same, it sounds like, that this prince or princess would come from the bloodline of Eris and Rhaella Targaryen, uh, which is why they married, because they wanted to uh, keep that in their bloodline. Um, And those are Daenerys' ancestors, and Jon's ancestors, Mm -hmm. uh, which hints that uh, one of them will probably be Azor Ahai. And so we're talking, this song has a direct relation to Jon and Daenerys' lineage. It's not just like a random thing. It ties into their ancestry. Yeah, it could also be the uh, song that, so the Rhaegar Targaryen was always known as a, a famous singer. Uh, it could be the song that maybe he sang to uh, Lyanna Stark. Oh, know, yeah. To like win, win her heart. Right, um, yeah. Also, uh, I, I want to mention that um, that song is also about what is happening for us as the audience. Mm. Uh, if you go back and you listen to the lyrics, it, it's essentially this moment of, of us having, like, not wanting to say goodbye to these characters. Mm-hmm. This episode was very much a, a love song to the characters of just like, don't we love these people so much? And everyone's given their purest character moments. And it's kind of just like, like I don't know if you had that moment last night while watching, but especially while that song is playing and we have, you know, Brian's smile and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And we're, we're sitting there, we're kind of like, man, I never want this to end. Right. It, uh, we were talking about Lord of the Rings with Helm's Deep, but it seemed like there was another Lord of the Rings reference yeah. here. And I'll dig more into this in the breakdown because there's actually some really interesting parallels. But uh, Pippin, the one of the hobbits sings this in Return of the King, the third movie, uh, during the the, the failed attack on uh, mm-hmm. Minas Tarth, and uh, and we see like a montage of different elements of the war uh, charging into battle, and you see it on the human level, you see it on the king's level, and his kind of arrogance as he's right. eating food while he's sending his son and other characters off to die, essentially on the front lines. Uh, in the same way that this beautiful voice is ringing out to kind of uh, put us in this headspace, right as we're about to fight in this horrible battle. Battle, it seemed like um, uh, the directors of this episode, uh, David Nutter, was kind of borrowing that. Yeah, moment. there's nothing like a high pitched man <laughs> squealing out uh, about uh, loved ones. Yeah. Uh, it, it always gets me. Yeah. Um, all right, but we got to move on to uh, answer some more of your questions about this episode. First, we got to take a quick break to thank two of our sponsors that help us bring Westeros Weekly to you every week. First off, cybercrime can happen to anyone. Oh, yeah. There are crooks out there looking to steal your passwords or credit card details. Stealing data from unsuspecting people on public Wi Fi is one of the simplest ways for hackers to make money other than getting a job. Uh, To protect myself, 
from cyber criminals. Uh, I've been using ExpressVPN for a lot of my uh, navigating around the internet. Mm -hmm. It secures your internet browsing by encrypting your data and hiding your public IP address. It has a really easy to use app that runs in the background of your computer, your phone, or your tablet. And uh, so I just like turn it on, it's one click, and then it's makes it so you can safely surf on public Wi-Fi whenever, you know, I do a lot of my writing at coffee shops and whatnot, yeah, yeah. so I use it there. Yeah, and it's just less than seven bucks a month and you can get the same ExpressVPN protection that I have that I use constantly. It is, by the way, ExpressVPN is the number one VPN service uh, rated by TechRadar. It comes with 30-day money-back guarantee because they're so proud of what they do. Uh, protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free of ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash rockstars. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash rockstars again that's three months free with a one-year package uh so visit expressvpn.com slash rockstars and you'll learn a bunch more great yeah expressvpn's great it's a I've, I've definitely had my uh credit card you had information your identity stolen, stolen. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's never fun so uh this is a way that you can just stay secure and then no one's going to peep in no third parties no weird ads are going to be like mm -hmm. making assumptions about what kind of person you are <laughs> and sending you other weird stuff that's that true. you don't want to see too, yeah 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 and also thank you to away travel for sponsoring this uh, episode away travel is a design company that makes the world's coolest suitcases they're made of a lightweight polycarbonate material that comes in four sizes and in nine colors so that you can match your suitcase to your house sigil if you'd like. <laughs> the coolest feature is that each bag comes with a built-in charger for electronic devices. Very cool. And a single charge of the Away Carry-On will charge your iPhone five times. Let's take a look at this thing. I love my Away Carry-On. It looks cool. It has lots of pockets and sections for all of my smaller items. I like trinkets. I carry <laughs> lots of uh, weird merch items. Yeah, you're buttons. stopped very often at the yes. airport. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I always forget. You always forget one of them. Uh, but this thing's amazing so get your own cool away luggage at awaytravel.com and use promo code rockstars for twenty dollars off your order again that's awaytravel.com and use the promo code rockstars for twenty dollars off cool all right oh, let's uh, move let's on to our next question yeah move next question oh <laughs> like we just hops in yeah <laughs> why doesn't he fly <laughs> what does he hop oh boy all right so uh what's our next question okay Sorry, our next from? question comes from at briggs asking where was the night king and what is his plan so this Good is an question. interesting question because a lot of people are, are asking this and uh, on its face uh, a lot of people are just like well we saw at the end of the episode there's this giant line of white walkers uh, and you know the, 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 there he is a night king somewhere there right? no he's actually not we no. don't see him now of course he could be holding back he could be allowing his infantry and his cavalry to maybe swoop in first do mm -hmm. the damage uh, he'll swing in on Viserion he'll essentially he set his alarm for like 10.30am that, <laughs> right, that morning yeah, or whatever he's like yeah, I yeah. gotta sleep in I gotta, yeah. I gotta stay sharp on yeah, my yeah, uh, hair tips yeah. uh, but uh, we also uh, learned the Night King's motivation this episode, yeah. and now these things are starting to kind of develop into maybe there's a second plan that we don't know about here. Yes, yeah, for sure. So Bran this week said that the Night King wants an endless night to erase this world, and erasing basically what Bran is, the living history as a three-eyed raven, and by erasing the memory and the history of humanity, you erase the existence of them, uh, all of them yourself. And this might debunk the theory that uh, of other things that the Night King might want, like revenge on the children of the forest, unless you consider the three-eyed raven uh, an emblem of the children mm -hmm. of the forest, then maybe getting revenge is still important play but it sounds like he just kind of wants destruction he wants endless night and uh he, he doesn't sound like he wants to rule or win the game of thrones and oh, sit on the iron care. throne himself he could not care less he yeah. just wants it all to go away uh bran is a roadblock to that plan to that uh inlet and game some might say uh bran is a three-eyed raven memory of the world night king wants to erase that memory the north remembers yeah it's the plot of coco yes it's exactly coco <laughs> yeah uh but it, erase it, the friend uh, of the previous generation yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah. which is bran uh uh but yeah. yeah so okay so we know that the good guys plan we're getting by the way to where the night king might be uh we're yeah. just we're just setting the stage here so we know that the good guys plan is to kill the night king uh you know by drawing him into uh bran's conference room yes his, uh the, the where, yeah, where he office takes, hours yeah he yeah. takes all his meetings <laughs> in front of the weirwood tree yeah. uh jenny reserve the weirwood retreat for me please uh all right the good guy's plan is to kill the night king there and hopefully that in turn kills all the white walkers and the whites too which i think is a decent plan right you hack the mainframe uh, uh upload a virus take down all the drone independence day uh, yes. uh white walkers yeah give it a cold uh, yeah, yeah yeah basically uh so they're gonna do that uh by leaving bran in the god's wood um by himself and with theon who is the only person on the show apparently who does not have a valyrian steel sword yeah but and uh but it's, and, it means a lot to yeah, him to and be it's able not to been bran. established as the best fighter uh, no, yeah. but it's fine because bran is only the hope 
for all humanity. Yes. Uh, but okay, so if he's going to meet the Night King there, surrounded by the weirwood trees, which these are the trees that kind of give Bran his power and yeah. give the ability of, of sight, basically, mm-hmm. or theoretically, uh, then we have this idea that the Night King would be caught off guard, right? It's a big oh, surprise sure. plan for him. But why would he not be expecting that, right? Why would he not uh, understand that they have the three-eyed mm. raven? They probably know that I, I, killing me could take everyone down. Uh, they were like, well, he'd be smart enough not to, you know, come out from uh, from behind and just get attacked. But if he's that smart, then maybe he's so smart that he's not even there. Yeah, it's interesting. There is a theory that we have talked about before that the Night King might not even go to Winterfell. He might skip over this. Uh, and this has been online for a bit. I'm sure some of you may have even thought this a couple years ago, that the Night King might instead go to King's Landing and instead convert the entire Lannister army and that Golden Company into an undead army that he can now bring back up north and attack Winterfell with a bigger force and kind of close in on them from two different fronts, make right. it a two-front war. It's the plan the Allies used in World War II against Germany, right? Make them fight a war on two fronts. Yeah. Uh, and that's unwinnable. Yeah, the very cold side up at Stalingrad and, right. and uh, the, it, the warmer side in <laughs> French trenches. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's exactly Coco. Yes. <laughs> it's exactly, it's exactly Coco. the same plot of Coco. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and you know what works about that? It would address if there's a, if he comes in on, on the back of Viserion or Isarian, uh, then wouldn't that finally pay off the image of King's Landing being burned down? Uh, and cl- and clearly, like some sort of huge destruction has happened there. Of course, it could still come from m- natural battle, but I don't know. It feels like there. It always felt like a dragon was to blame for that, um, and we just had never really considered. Well, there's, the Night King has a dragon; he can get there real fast. Yeah, you know, back in season six, there was that one like future vision montage where we saw like rapid fire visions from Bran mm-hmm. when he was touching the weirwood tree, and one of them showed uh, the sh- the shadow of a dragon looming over the right. roofs of King's Landing. And you know, some people thought that was paid off when Drogon and and Daenerys arrived for that big council meeting at the end, but we didn't see that in particular. Mm-hmm. And the fact that that still hasn't been officially paid off made people think right. that maybe that is and, what we're going to see. And reminder, when we did see uh, King. King's Landing burned down, there was snow. Right. It was so cold. So it's not, it, it, you know, if you're just thinking, well, it's just Daenerys. Or she, Daenerys doesn't bring winter with her. Yes, that's right? true. But someone else does. Someone else does. Right. Yeah. Coco. All right. So uh, moving on uh, to our next question. Some of you guys actually have been submitting questions to us by tagging new rock stars on the app Stardust. That's how we take our video questions. Uh, so the people, by the way, who submit questions that way and tag us, follow us on Stardust, you follow Game of Thrones, and you tag us every week, you get entered to win a free trip to Los Angeles yeah. to watch the Game of Thrones finale with Come us. Come hang out with way. us, yeah. So uh, definitely a great reason to submit your questions via Stardust. Everyone that you're about to see uh, on the Stardust app, uh, they do their reactions on there, but they submit their questions every week. Each one of these people is now uh, up for a chance to, to get flown out to watch the Game of Thrones finale with us at a, at a screening party, which That's I'm exciting. super excited about. All right, let's uh, listen to our first one. Okay, I just got done watching season eight, episode two of Game of Thrones. A question I have is who makes this out alive? Because we do have three more episodes after this. My guess is John. Interesting, yeah. Not, not a bad guess, right? Uh, yeah. TJ Reese, uh, 1259. Uh, Eric, who do you think makes it out alive? Um, I think a good chance of someone to survive are people like Bran or uh, at least Samuel Tarly because they're so focused on what's next, carrying on the torch of the history of, of Westeros. So even though that they might be... or. Samuel might be down in the crypts and some stuff might go down there. I think he's going to make it out okay. And uh, I think characters like Tyrion still have more to do. I don't think this is his final episode yet because he hasn't yet completed this redemption arc. He's made too many mistakes and it seems like the show is setting him up to uh, come back and redeem himself. So unless he does it in some way that saves the Battle of Winterfell and he's the hero of that battle, uh, I think there's still more story for him to tell beyond this episode. I might be eating crow <laughs> next well, week. Yeah. Uh, which is uh, going down on a uh, crow. Uh, uh, you made it that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it's just, uh, <laughs> just, a, just a gross joke about uh, men at the wall. Um, okay, so I, I think you can't underestimate, though, what you what you just said about, or it could be, you know, that he goes down saving them. Sure. I think that we're definitely going to see moments like that in, in this. Uh, it's like how Hodor, Hodor went out, right? Uh, this idea that maybe the last act someone does is the completion of their redemption arc. And when you start thinking about it that way, well, now it's like, oh, 
everyone could die, right? Like, yeah. and I think they were trying to foreshadow the deaths of everyone, yeah, uh, except for a few characters. So, right, Jamie could die in in, in the last act uh, of that finally redeems him. Uh, Serbian now could yeah. could certainly die. She's finally gotten the acknowledgement that she, uh, she's always wanted. Um, Sir like Jorah. Theon, yeah. Jorah, like yeah. all these characters want this this redemption. In fact, I feel like they're almost going to be like trying to dive on the grenade yeah, and like, being me, like, me, me, no. I'm the one that needs to be redeemed <laughs> this way since we're all probably going to die. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, because also, I mean, if it was Joss Whedon running this show, uh, some of them are just uh, going to die abruptly. Like yeah. They're just going to die and there's not going to be a lot of meaning to it, which right. that's going to be real sad too. But in terms of who makes it through, I think one of the few characters that did not have death foreshadowed upon her uh, is Sansa. Yeah, uh, she has clearly the ability to motivate an internal conflict on the hero side, uh, with this idea of the North isn't going to bow mm-hmm. to to Daenerys Targaryen. Uh, though I don't know if they they might to Aegon Targaryen though. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's something to consider. But as of right now, they just started a new sense of tension and they didn't really give her any finality in this episode. So I think she's going to make it through the next episode. Uh, Real quick, someone who I think they did foreshadow potential death for is Arya. Yes. Uh, And what I'm specifically going to acknowledge is, you know what she didn't say uh, to death? Not today. She said, oh. we, we're probably going to die tomorrow. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, so she finally is kind of acknowledging it might it might be time to die. She also didn't say, I enjoyed that. <laughs> that was worth it. <laughs> Instead, she looked over at the camera in this haunting uh, thousand yard stare after sex with Gendry. I mean, what does that mean? what sex is like, bud. <laughs> yeah. Not as well, I've been told by it, countless pornography videos. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you listen to them on podcasts? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. How do you experience them? Yeah, uh, oh, do we have another question <laughs> from, uh, yes? To, to salvage us from this topic? Yes, please. Uh, next uh, Stardust question. Hi there. I'm Victor from Africa, Zimbabwe. Uh, I just want to know, do you think... Um, Bran is prophesying Jamie's death. Okay, so speaking of characters that are potentially uh, foreshadowed to die, Bran has his fated reunion with with Jamie, or the I guess the Three Eyed Raven does. So the question that Victor here is asking is, did Bran actually kind of slip up and hint that Jamie might die? Do you know what moment I think? He's yeah, it's in the God's Wood, and he yeah. says, "Who knows if there is an afterwards?" You yeah, know? which a real sneaky interpretation of that is. For you. For you, yeah. Or right. for all of us. But why would he say it specifically to Jamie? It, it seemed like this is the second moment where Bran's just like using his haunting tree boy stare to rattle the Kingslayer uh, after earlier saying the things we do for love. Uh, right. I think he doesn't, maybe it's part of the Three-Eyed Raven's vision in order uh, for success to happen that the Three-Eyed Raven not feel so confident. And we saw how later, or that uh, the Kingslayer not feel so confident. And later we saw Jamie talk to Brienne and say, I'm not the fighter I used to be. I want to serve under your command maybe that's part of his strategy is to shake his confidence a little bit so that he reunites not just this uh, important relationship with Brienne but the two swords that they carry are part of the same original sword ice and maybe in order for destiny to move forward these two swords have to be brought back together Mm -hmm. so that Ned Stark's wisdom and his legacy and his bravery can help lead them to victory so you think he'll wield two swords in his one hand yeah Uh, at some point they'll uh, put swords together they'll fused together and uh they'll be one again why don't they just make his other hand one of the swords oh you talk- like like ash from evil dead like yeah, <laughs> yeah like right. he just has a stabby like heavy or sword merle on from arm. walking dead yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. how did they not think of this we better write them yeah the, send a raven the fools <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so yeah, I think uh, to answer his question, it could be foreshadowed. But I like your idea that Bran is actually a master manipulator of mm-hmm. of his con- uh, of his confidence, uh, and that makes me think we need a video, and we'll do this after the season is done. Looking back at everything Bran has said and seeing if he was doing Doctor Strange level manipulating. Oh, yes. Of I need things to go in an exact perfect way. He did kind of admit that when he said, "Why didn't you tell them about what I did to you?" And he's like, "Well, then they you wouldn't be able to fight for us." He is clearly making chess moves, and yes. I'm just wondering retroactively which ones have we already missed this little bobby fisher is emotionally distancing <laughs> yeah, himself yeah. from everyone so not you pointed at victor our, our no, stardust question asked he's him. talking about bran not you <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> bran uh is uh is alienating everyone so that afterwards you can say aha see actually the things that i said had a deeper meaning if you go back and piece them all together like a puzzle yeah he's I, like, I, I seem like a normal person i can't believe you guys were buying this whole thing where i didn't make any sense the whole time i yes. had a plan the whole yeah. time all right what's our next artist question my main question coming out of it is why doesn't john just deny wanting the iron throne right away when he tells danny who he is and she's upset about his claim what an episode i guess my big burning question is do you think that 
Danny is going to dispute the validity of John's claim to the throne. John and Danny, who's going to kill who? Ooh, okay. Yeah. So it's a lot of different. I like this frame that we froze on, actually. Because <laughs> it, this is That's how, how we, we all feel, feel. <laughs> yeah. about it. Uh, so there's there were three questions in there, but I think they're all kind of about the same topic. Yes. One is, why didn't John immediately say, hey, I have no interest in the Iron Throne? Right. And then uh, she's asking, you know, who's going to kill who? And then the guy in the middle was asking uh, if... Danny's going to end up challenging his claim. Right. Uh, I mean, we, there is another witness who they could bring in to prove his claim. Helen Reed Helen was Reed present has, at the Tower of Joy. the only person alive, yeah. theoretically. Although they did say this episode, anyone who's not here is basically a, a white now. Right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he's further south. He's down in Moat Kalin in the Yeah, in the this is the uh, father of... Uh, of Mira Reed. Mira Reed. And he was, he was with Ned Stark at the Tower of Joy. He knows that Jon Snow isn't actually Ned Stark's bastard. He's the son of Lyanna Stark. And probably if uh, Ned gossips, uh, he also knows he's a son of Rhaegar Targaryen. So I, uh, he could be brought in. It seems like he's more important in the books than in mm -hmm. the show. They they didn't even really give him lines in that Tower of Joy flashback. It yeah, he's seem just like, like he's eating a frog today. on the side or <laughs> right, something. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that is one way that he could prove it. Another way they could just simply get past this is just by marrying each other. If mm -hmm. they just bring in a septon or have a maester do it or do some, you know, a shotgun wedding, go to the Westeros mm -hmm. version of Vegas and figure this all out, they can solve this immediately. If they genuinely love each other, who's to say they can't be co-monarchs? It's something that was predicted by Davos and Varys and Tyrion. Why can't... Why not both? Why can't they both be rulers? Why does ha one have to be other? Like, I, I don't see John having too much of an aversion to letting Danny do most of the ruling and let her do most of the speaking. And he's just kind of like, oh, I'll sue me. <laughs> but then the question that our first uh, uh, Stardust uh, submitter asked is, why didn't he then right away say, oh, I'm not like interested in, in the throne? Yeah. Is it because he actually might be, right? He, he didn't want to be king of the North. But maybe he wants to be king of the seven realms. Uh, uh, so I got to wonder, it, I actually brought this up a little bit in our snap reaction. Um, we post those every week right after the episode airs with just some quick thoughts on it. Uh, the whole series has been building up to making women, see, especially this episode, making women be uh, taken just as seriously as the men, if not more so, right? Everyone now, every major ruler is basically a, a woman right now. Uh, I don't know what I mean by basically a woman. <laughs> they, are, they are women. Yes. Uh, but, but everything has been uh, pointing in that direction. If so, then I, I think it might even go beyond the idea of these two sides are equal, and it kind of could replace the idea of the firstborn male heir to the crown prince uh, being worthy, I think they're trying to say, well, no, maybe this this woman, Daenerys, who is the, the last living child of the previous king, has the better claim. And the reason I'm kind of getting into this thing about and addressing that person's question about the claim is because I think that we got to remember also there's only one Iron Throne. Mm -hmm. So it's not a... It's not know, a love seat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I yeah. made that same joke in, in, uh, <laughs> in, in the snap reaction. Uh, but I think that idea of you can't share the crown. Not, not, not really, right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's intruding even on our politics, right? Like we had, like you know, the top Democrat and the top Republican uh, share the ticket, and that's how our country is run. You know, maybe who knows how things would be, but that's not that doesn't go with the ego of people who yeah. seek that kind of power. It's like the Kang and Kodos Treehouse of Horror episode of The Simpsons, where Bob Dole and <laughs> Bill Clinton share the ticket, and it's like eh, I don't know no, who to vote for. Yeah, don't yeah. blame me; I voted for Kodos. Right. But uh, yeah, I think you're you're onto something here in that the history of Westeros and our normal history makes it you can't have like a two people, even despite how much better that probably would work if you had like a partnership at the top of something sure. making these tough decisions it, that's not historically the case there was um the this the case of um queen alisane and king jaharis the former targaryen ancestors in which they were kind of co-monarchs even though jaharis was the main monarch and his wife queen alisane who was also his relative they kind of ruled together and she went in his stead as a diplomat kind of like a secretary of state mm -hmm. to uh to make these important diplomatic meetings for him but I, I think I think this is a time that those old patriarchal rules need to be broken and shattered. And we saw that when Jamie knighted Brienne to become a knight, even though women are not supposed to be knights, I think the show is signaling that the rules are changing, the wheels are breaking, and that we don't have to have the old rules apply in this new world that we're going to build. So if that's true, then let's address the last question uh, we got there. Who has to kill who in order to... to 
to finalize this, obviously you're kind of implying there that it would be maybe Danny is trying to at least be the last one standing. She certainly has made it very clear. If anyone has a Terminator like uh, mission here, it's her, right? She was born for this. She's been told this her whole life um, that she that she was destined for this. Uh, I guess Viserys felt like he was probably, but uh, either way, she is the one that would be maybe ruthless enough in order to claim the throne to maybe be willing to kill John. But if John is potentially Azor High. That prophecy talks about plunging your your weapon into uh, you know your loved one. Uh, it could be that maybe in her pursuit of the Iron Throne, she goes one step too far, which they have foreshadowed her willingness to do that before. Uh, that maybe he has to put an end to her, and it ends up being him at the end. And I think so. Is either she good, she tries to kill him because she wants the throne, or he has to kill her because of going mad essentially yeah and we did see this episode she is kind of in a downward spiral of uh, of authority from mm-hmm. talking with Sansa and Sansa rebuffs her and then she finds out the truth about Jon's true lineage people aren't even making eye contact with her it feels like she's losing a lot of her power this episode yeah and so she might uh, do what what a cat does when backed into, yeah, into get a desperate, corner right yeah. get sassy yes yeah real sassy yeah Oh, whoa, right. what is this? Oh, I always act surprised because well, I it's am. a very loud <laughs> yes. crow. <laughs> okay, at Ali Bar told us, Ali Bar told us, wants to know, uh, what did Tyrion and Bran talk about besides his journey? Right. So this so is a that conversation that we, we cut away we from. talked about earlier, it was, uh, per- I felt very purposely cut away from. Yeah. I did also kind of feel where he was like, you know, I have time. I'll listen to your story. And the very next time we see Tyrion, he's talking to Jamie, almost like he was like, I had to get out of that conversation. Yeah. Like, it didn't imply that they spent so much time together, but let's assume that they did spend a good few hours going over everything that Bran has, uh, everything that happened transforming Bran into the Three Eyed Raven. Yeah. Uh, I think that this could be actually essential to the events going forward, even though they brush yeah. past it. They have the person with the uh, established in this episode, the most brilliant mind in Westeros. And he has now the information of the Three-Eyed Raven. The Three-Eyed Raven, it, it seems like he he doesn't he doesn't think in terms of strategy so much. We earlier we talked about him being the Bobby Fisher of chess moves, but at the same time, he kind of seems passive a bit. Uh, Tyrion might be the one that actually can use this information in a new way in the last moment. Maybe yeah, this seems like Tyrion's uh, first step to fixing his poor strategy blunders in previous seasons and actually going back to what has always made him cleverer and stronger than other people, an appreciation of history. You know, in season one, he was one of the few people who believed that White Walkers actually existed, despite it taking other people five seasons to learn that truth. And he knew the great kings of the past, and that was kind of his inspiration for being such a good hand of the king in season two. So now he's like, you know what? No, I'm going to stop trusting myself. I'm going to go back and go to the living history of Westeros and pick his brain Mm -hmm. for for three hours. You mentioned earlier that uh, you think Tyrion will go down in the crypts because that's where Tyrion ordered him we saw him at the end of the episode despite her telling him to go down there he's there on the battlements i don't think he's going to be in the crypts Mm. in the final episode i think he has an important role to play based off of what bran told him about maybe some weakness of the night king or some kind of strategy decision Uh, i think we're going to see a repeat of Tyrion's uh surprises tricks up his sleeve that he had in the battle of blackwater he is going to have some kind of new strategy battle plan that maybe he's kept from the other people or maybe he learned last minute some kind of revision to the battle plan that we're going to see unfold in the final or in the next episode so it's certainly a decent theory that 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 could happen Uh, the one uh, reason why I'll throw out an alternate is because I feel like other characters have been associated with the the journey uh, with the Battle of the Dead uh, against the Dead. Uh, Sam kind of feels like maybe the surrogate a little bit for Bran, hmm. and has and John very much represents that role. If anything, Tyrion has always represented the politics of Westeros, kind of like Littlefinger did, right? It's like almost if Littlefinger suddenly cared about the Night King, it'd be it'd be off brand. I I don't think that. Tyrion necessarily doesn't care, but I think that it's possible that he was given information that's going to be relevant in the episodes after the Battle of Winterfell. For instance, Tyrion might be the you know this top political mind who now might know the truth about Jon Snow. Yeah. So he might know that there there's this big complicated thing on the other side of if they survive this, and then maybe that's where it'll come into play is him having this this awareness of who the rightful king is. So instead, he could be hand of the king and try to figure out his role to play after this battle's over. But what is this? Oh, we have another. Oh, oh my goodness! Another question. Uh, Nutmeg five ten asks, "How old are Arya and Gendry?" <laughs> okay, so 
I wonder why she's asking. Oh, nutmeg is asking. I genderized nutmeg. I assume yes. nutmeg was a woman, but I, I wonder why nutmeg is asking. Yeah. Uh, and so was everybody else, right? We have a graphic here. Yeah. For this. Apparently, a lot of people were wondering. <laughs> this is one of the top uh, rated questions. And HBO, uh, anticipating this, tweeted out by age 18 in Westeros, you should have all these things. And, and uh, alluding to the fact that Arya is, yeah, is 18. Yeah, basically, it's a lot of clues Chill. that they're like, this, yeah. this tweet basically says, Arya is 18 years old, by yes. the way. Uh, but but let's see our other graphic. This is how big that question was in that moment. There was a spike, at, you know, for East Coast time, a, a little past 9:30 p.m., 9:40 p.m. Huge spike. Maisie Williams' age. Yes. Uh, and I think it's because we all got real scared for a second. Am I uh, gonna get? Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, kicked, my door <laughs> kicked in by whole federal. Thing has been federal agent <laughs> sting. Yes. Just, just kicking. Sting. All right, perverts. Swarm, swarm. Yeah. Well, here's the deal. Maisie Williams, who plays Arya, is 22 years old. Joe Dempsey, who plays Gendry, is 31 years old. So everyone involved here is a grown up. They gave. Even if we saw them grow up, yes, they are currently grown ups. Right. Uh, and the showrunners gave Maisie Williams 100% uh, control over what she, how she would act this and block it, mm -hmm. what articles of clothing she would remove, how much she would see. Maisie Williams was in complete control over all that. So we don't have to worry about any weird stuff happening behind the scenes. Yes. Yeah. Actually, instead of caring about her age uh i think it's super fascinating that this is actually probably the the most appropriate sex scene that we've actually yeah. ever had on this show uh you know th it's not done for manipulation it's not done to try to make a, a ghost baby uh, come out of uh, you uh it's not done uh for political reasons like there's nothing to it uh other than she wants it and even with with Gentry, she actually is sensitive. I mean, it kind of came off as like a fun little badass moment there of like, take off your own damn pants. I'm not the the red witch or whatever. Yeah. But it actually is like you make the choice for your part because previously it was taken from you, you know, or well, almost was at least. Right. So she's like, look, I'm making my choice. You take off your pants if you if you're down to do it. Uh, and like that's the most progressive damn sex scene the show has ever had. Yeah, it's one of the most normalized sex scenes. It's just like characters just doing it just for the feeling. Like they right. want to feel what it's like. It's not any kind of weird political machination. It's not like the the dragon and the wolf coming together. And is there a conspiracy at work here? You know, our characters gonna get pregnant. I don't think we have to worry about any of that here. It's just like two young people who are sexually interested yeah, in each other, world, baby. acting yeah. on those impulses that, on the last night of the world. You right. Know? It's, it's um, fine. It's okay. And we don't need to worry about any of it. I think this episode had a lot to do with human connection and what it means to be alive, what living is defined as, yeah. right? The, we had our speech about what death means, but I think the episode was about what it means to be a living human person and because and that's who we're, what we're battling for, right? And so human connections we saw in so many forms. We saw sharing a, a meal between Sansa and Theon. Mm -hmm. We saw sharing a drink with all uh, the people in, in front of the fire there and, and, and sharing stories and sharing song. And then here, you know, sharing your bodies, right, and 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 having sex, like this, this is one very important uh, part of human connection. Uh, I thought this was like kind of it, an amazing moment in the series as a whole, uh, but it did kind of just leave me a little weird with this this face that Arya is right, making this at the end stare. here. But I think that evokes. To I think her... it has to do with the the death that is coming, and yeah. not so much, uh, huh? So that's sex. Not interested. Well, something. Arya always feels uh, alienation. You know, she she hooked up with um, Gendry be to follow through on her desire for a family back in season three. And, mm -hmm. and she's like, you can be my family. He's like, I wouldn't be your family. You'd be my lady. And since then, she's been on this journey invoking the stranger of the seven and the many-faced god. She's kind of death incarnate. She doesn't kind of like how Bran doesn't really feel human anymore. Mm -hmm. Arya, despite trying to feel human in these final moments, is feeling that it's, it's hard for her to just feel the kind of normal emotions normal people. Feel. But this is the most back to Arya she's ever been, right? Previously in Bravos, like she's like, "Oh, you're ready to be a faceless man," and it's like, "No, it turns out I, I am Arya Stark." This is a desire Arya Stark had the whole time. Uh, ironically, it's also a desire that uh, Robert Baratheon had, right? He points out yeah. way back in, I got in a, season one, I got a, I've got son, a son, you, you have a daughter. Yeah, uh, let's we'll get merge together. Our houses. Yeah, yeah uh, and it wasn't these two, but uh, these two are a much more healthy relationship right. than the previous one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh. Okay, here we go. Another question. This one coming from... I like from... that the, the scream of the raven is always polite enough to wait till we finish our previous yeah. answer. He, yeah. yeah, he knows when to come in. <laughs> Han Solo 88 asks, is Theon in love with Sansa? Interesting question. Uh, well, let's look at their history and kind of see what, what that 
would lead to. So they both escaped Ramsey Bolton together. Mm -hmm. I remember, I think you were with me when we were watching that episode live that our friends were like, oh my God, they killed themselves. Yeah, <laughs> or they, they just jumped they off the battlement. They thought it was joint yeah. suicide, yeah. Uh, which it was not. Um, so they, they have that, you know, that bond forged through pain and mm -hmm. shared, uh, you know, shared misery, which is uh, in, in real life, one of the strongest bonds you can have with someone, but often is, is non-romantic unless you're watching a movie and then for no reason it suddenly becomes romantic. Yes. It, I, it feels yeah. like a brother sister kind of platonic connection. They both, yeah, they were both horribly tortured by Ramsey Bolton and it was kind of defining for both of them that experience, the fact that they were able to survive it. And I don't think there's any more to it than that. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like our relationship. Right, it's just, we were both Platonic, tortured yeah, by an <laughs> evil tyrant of, in a castle, and uh, and then we don't talk about it. Yeah, right. Uh, but if you know us personally, you know who we're talking about. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, now's the time to move on to our power rankings. Yeah, yes. yeah let's yeah. do it. Power this, rankings. This is a really interesting episode for power rankings because oh, yeah. it's one that no, it, anyone, whoever gets voted at the top of the power rankings this week, it didn't do it through... Uh, threats mm -hmm. right this was the the most positive portrayal of these uh, these yeah. characters so it in my opinion it's probably got to go toward people who at their core are the best and most powerful yeah. rather than you know having to rely on threats or weapons yeah emotional uh, victories um, kind of characters who are building each other up rather than like killing each other in battle so on at third place uh, we have our number three vote with 9.2 percent Jamie Lannister uh, people feel like which I think yeah it's it's definitely a power moment for him because he survived this trial that he really should not have gotten a, a non-guilty verdict at <laughs> It's just really through Bran deciding to spare him, well, but he hand made didn't a, fit. Yeah. He made a good argument for himself by saying that you know I I like the fact that he stood his ground and stood up for himself. I would do it all again. I was protecting my family. Mm -hmm. Aside from maybe the push out the window is the one thing he regrets. Which he like looked at Bran a little bit like we're yeah. good, right? You're not gonna like right. surprise state witness. This but I moment. think his uh, his anointing of uh, Brienne and deciding to come and right. fight for her was in a way a powerful moment for Jamie as well. Or, and for this series, right? It, that's kind of touching on what we were saying earlier of this idea of the, you know, the previous privilege that has only been reserved for men, uh, like being knighted, but also just being the hero of this show and potentially ruling Westeros. Here's me saying, hey, I'm passing it. You get it too. Yeah. It also, uh, ha it doesn't just come from Jamie. It also comes from Tormund. Right, he's like, if I were king, yeah. You know, I, I mean, he means something different when he says he'd keep knighting her again right, and again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but knight without the K. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I do think that 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 transition moment is kind of a like, you know, it's going to be sound political. I don't mean it to, but essentially, like, it's like a reach down and then pull up past the glass ceiling of Westeros, at least. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Jamie had a lot of power to give, but he definitely isn't the most powerful uh, at all. So second place. Let's see, we have Arya Stark, 23.3% uh, of the vote. Big jump there. Uh, interesting. Why Arya? What do you think? Well, definitely a moment of agency for her to see her act on her impulses and finally, you know, bed Gendry and to, and to take control of that scenario. Also, pretty badass moments where the way she wins him over is by, you know, throwing daggers into yeah. the wall. Later, she does it with uh, with arrows. She's like, all right, give me another weapon. I want to show how good my time, aim is. one more time, but yeah. it was X-rated. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, definitely a powerful moment for her where, where she's able to show how much of a badass she's become over the course of the series. Right. Right, and, and it shows, you know, and now I suddenly became the most hyped for her scenes in this next battle. Of course, we've only seen her running, but maybe they're actually, I, I think if you look at her scene with the Hound, it kind of implied to me that they're going to have a little bit of a Cyclops and Wolverine <laughs> uh, pair up of like in the battlefield, uh, like, you know, he'll throw her into, yeah. into a bunch Toss of fights. Me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. She just yeah. gets shredded immediately. Until, yeah, different, different battle uh, reference. No, yeah. but uh, she has her weapon finally. I think they kind of established we're going to have a player in the field who is, you know, level 10, uh, in skill and now I'm like super hyped for that so aside from what you know she was able to do for her character they also set her up to be the most badass person to watch on the field yeah. and kind of a powerful moment for her to acknowledge to the Hound and Beric Dondarrion that she no longer has them on their kill list and she's like I'm not gonna spend my last night in the world with you two old losers yeah. I'm yeah. going downstairs which was an unscripted yeah. line the actress was actually saying that to those actors yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was very mean actually yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, alright who's in first uh, first place obviously Sir Brienne of Tar. 37.2 percent so undisputed oh, i'm so most glad we pulled if you're looking at the video version we pulled the, the smile that smile 
that like is huge and kind of a little like a happy Mr. Burns look to it. <laughs> but oh man, d- d- I I mean I teared up at, at this. Yeah. This was amazing. This is exactly what she's always wanted to become a knight uh, from the very beginning of her arc in the series. She wanted to be able to. She's already been more of a knight in her actions, her behavior, her outlook than every other character on the show. She embodies all the qualities that a knight is supposed to embody. Whereas all the other characters who actually have knighthood have been in some ways false knights in their behavior, have betrayed and broken their vows in other various ways, and then redeemed themselves. But through and through, Brienne has been the true Most knight. Knightly, and it's, yeah. it's nice to see her finally come into the title uh, of this thing that she's earned over and over again. Yeah, it goes with the the point I was making earlier of, of this episode. Whoever had the most power was going to be probably someone who, like, internally kind of kind of had it. It does set it, make me worry about her a bit now a bit. moving forward. How much more growth can she have as a character? Um, and it's worth pointing out the title of this episode, "A Knight of the Seven Kingdoms," is ba- is what was used in context of her when when Jamie knighted her, and then uh, Tyrion gave her the toast. So she is the Knight of the Seven Kingdoms. Yeah, this episode is. Remember, it's about being uh, human and and what it means. To be alive like yeah. this is the character that expresses that you know in in their most f- uh, p- potential fulfilled uh way uh and again i there's something real quick to just point out here becoming a knight and being knighted is insanely huge right it's not like her getting the promotion she wanted that has to go into history books like they mm-hmm. have to now write and record who knighted her now she is knighted she's going to be written as the first this was confirmed she is the first female knight of the seven kingdoms like that's gonna go down in the in the citadel history that's amazing yeah, yeah. yeah for sure uh well now uh let's let's end every westeros weekly as we always do by watching the teaser <laughs> for next week's episode yeah. give your quick thoughts on it let's cool. roll the clip let's do it the most heroic thing we can do now is to look the truth in the face. The Night King is coming. The dead are already here. Start your ground! Ooh. Ooh. And not a single shot of the Night King. Not a single shot. We saw a dragon, but like it didn't look like Viserion. No. It looked like Drogon. You couldn't really see who was riding the back and probably it was Danny. Um, but yeah, so still no Night King. And also an interesting line from Daenerys to John: the dead are already here. Is that a line implying the fact that the dead are already here? They're down in our crypts. They're mm-hmm. already amongst us as we well, speak. Well, and we see, we saw in the previews of the Battle of the Bastard, we saw a lot of uh, sword fighting. Mm-hmm. Uh, we didn't see that here, right? We see a little bit of flaming arrow, a, a little bit of fires or whatnot, but we didn't even see the whites really like Not really, attacking. No, yeah. So we just saw people inside of the castle on the run or, or feeling like they're being attacked in there. It also reminds me of the uh, siege that was done on, was it on Castle Rock? Was oh, it, with the Unsullied? That, that it came from the inside and, and yeah, below, yeah. they didn't expect it coming. I mean, it'd be very strategic of them and they don't tend to work that way, but it does feel like we're up for some sort of huge misdirect. Yes. Uh, next week. That might involve vacating the castle the way uh, the the Lannisters did at Casterly Rock. That might yeah. be the only way to avoid these zombies resurrecting in your crypts is just evacuate. Right, which is kind of a, a, a moment at the end of Buffy, but it just <laughs> the, it, a lot of Buffy references. Uh, but just that idea of the place isn't, isn't what actually matters, right? right it's the, the people. Yeah. Uh, so that'd be interesting. All right, but that's enough of this week's Westeros Weekly. Uh, we got to get some rest before uh, next <laughs> huge battle of, of Winterfell. Uh, but we have also plenty of content coming all week yeah. that uh, we'll be, both be working on. Thanks so much for watching yeah. and listening to this. Do not forget to subscribe both to the New Rockstars YouTube channel and to this Westeros Weekly podcast feed. Everything that Eric's got coming up uh, will also come out on that feed and follow that new MCU podcast Inside Marvel for all of our Avengers Endgame content. Uh, Also, reminder that we're having an Endgame screening uh, at the El Capitan. It's going to be like epic. I'm so excited for it. There's very few tickets left, actually. Um, And we're also having like a VIP after party. We're going to meet and greet. We'll have some special guests. It's going to be super exciting. Uh, We'll have a link to that in the show notes and description below if you want to join us to watch watch Avengers Endgame with us at the basically official Disney theater. Uh, that's going to be amazing. Follow us on Twitter at New Rockstars. Tweet your Game of Thrones questions with the hashtag Westeros Weekly. Uh, and follow me uh, at FEMA on Twitter and at Philip Molina on Instagram. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at EA Voss. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Have a good one.